Welcome to the Focus and Chill podcast, where we discuss productivity tactics that work for neurodivergent individuals. Every episode, we interview guests with lived experience of neurodiversity who also have a solid productivity and habit game, and pass the learnings on to you, our wise and benevolent audience. We're your hosts, Jeremy and Joey. I'm Joey, and I coach creatives to get moving on their most ambitious projects through the power of solid habits and strong focus. I'm also a perpetual student of psychology and perpetually on a quest to a one-armed chin-up. And I'm Jeremy, a neurospicy software developer turned startup founder, building the Focus Bear app to help people with ADHD and autism thrive at work. My cool party trick is leaving parties early so I can get to sleep in time for my two hour long morning routine. The Focus and Chill podcast is brought to you by Focus Bear, a habit and productivity app that makes healthy habits and deep work the path of least resistance. If you have a tendency to check emails or scroll through Instagram first thing in the morning, but long to develop a meditation and exercise habit first thing, Focus Bear can help you. The app blocks distractions on all your devices and guides you through your habits one at a time. Throughout the day, Focus Bear assists you to stay in deep work by blocking websites and apps that are unrelated to your chosen focus mode. Life's not all about work though. You'll be prompted to take regular breaks to rest your eyes and stretch your muscles. At the end of the day, Focus Bear helps you switch off. Work-related apps get hidden so you can unwind and sleep well. Check out the app by going to focusbear.io. Welcome to episode number 45 of the Focus and Chill podcast. We're thrilled to be joined by Richard Ray today. A genuine pioneer in new media, Richard has over 25 years of experience in sales, market analysis, project management, and customer relations. He helps organizations and individuals achieve success in multiple areas. His passion is exploring the intersection of innovation and artificial intelligence and how AI can transform businesses and lives. Welcome to the show, Richard. Hey, Jeremy. Great to be here. Richard actually interviewed me for his podcast a while ago, and I thought it would be really fun to turn the tables, especially because you mentioned that you're you're also someone who fits into the neurodivergent spectrum. Do you want to tell us about that to begin yeah. with? Well, absolutely. And by the way, your podcast was one of our most successful episodes ever. So it you know, generated a, a really good amount of uh, views and downloads. So uh, thank you for coming on my podcast because you gave us some success. Oh, great um, to hear. Well, when it comes to the neurodivergent side of things, I actually formally discovered I had ADHD quite late in life. So I was uh, 48. I'm 51 now. And so there's a whole bunch of people on here going, oh, there's an old guy there, but whatever. Um, but the reality is I'd been dealing with neurodivergence my entire life and not knowing why. The The whole thing was I had always felt different, was always treated differently and acted differently from other people around me. But I also had strange kind of mixture of skills and detriments. So one minute I could be creating something that people are going, how, how on earth did you do that? That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And doing things that people thought just wasn't possible. And the next minute I'm having trouble tying my shoelaces. Hmm. And it was just this complete split, which was utter madness. Hmm. And now I know why. And now I know how to actually uh, deal with it. And I'm also helping people um, around that as well. So that's kind of the short version. Yeah, that, that's so frustrating for me as well, those times of genius and then times of utter stupidity. Mm. And it, it's very unpredictable as well. Do you find that? Uh, well, now that I've become medicated and you know, I've, I've managed to get that sorted out, I have less of an issue there. But mm. also I've structured my life in such a way that I'd already put in mechanisms so I didn't have to deal with that. But also I've been self-medicating for years. So, you know, the sheer volume of coffee and Red Bull I've been drinking to try and get that dopamine hit. Uh, that's that certainly helped. Uh, you know, I, I do worry uh, what I've done to my body with the sheer amount of ca- uh, caffeine I've ingested over the years. Uh-huh. But uh, I'm not going to back. You know, I, I have few vices. So that is something I'm going to stick with. I, actually, I have gone off coffee on a few occasions, uh, tried, you know, sports where I stayed off caffeine for a while. Mm-hmm. And that first espresso or that first kind of red bull, oh my goodness, it's the most beautiful <laughs> thing you've ever tasted in your life. <laughs> but um, no, it, it can be very frustrating. And there's times when you know that you're capable of things and you can't understand why you've made a dumb mistake. 
And it is that unpredictability that's a challenge because one minute, you know, you're blowing things out of the water and you're absolutely amazing. And then you make the most stupid, ridiculous mistake that can have very negative knock-on effects to other people. And that's actually the worst part for me. It's not necessarily how it impacts me. It's how it impacts other people that has been probably the, the most upsetting thing over the years. Mm, yeah, I can relate to that. The impact that it has on my wife sometimes when I'm mm -hmm. disorganized, that's not fun. But it sounds like you've developed a bunch of strategies, both in terms of working, being medicated, but also other coping mechanisms. What have you found to be the most effective? Well, one of the, the things I stumbled across, and again, this is, you know, for people who are maybe new to the, the world of ADHD or knowing about it, you've got this whole concept of hyper-focus. Okay. And luckily, I've managed to get myself into jobs where I could hyper-focus on doing something. And I managed to put myself into positions where it's exciting and uh, relevant and interesting. Sometimes I have put myself into those positions to do something new, and I actually don't know what I'm talking about. But I learn very, very quickly as a result. So again, that's another part of ADHD in that I've given myself an amazing time crunch. So I did a project once for a large broadcaster, and they said, hey, can you do this? I won't say what it was. And it was like, yeah, I can do that. Sure, no worries. Not a clue. So I went away very quickly and uh, learned how to do it. I'm going to give you one example. I designed an interactive TV service for Sky TV in the UK. That's the equivalent of Foxtel in Australia. Mm -hmm. And it was the first interactive football service, soccer service in the world. And I did a lot of the design work on it. But I knew nothing about football at all. Not a thing. And it's amazing how quickly I suddenly became an expert. I could channel things that my brother, who was a football obsessive, could do. But when mm. I knew I had to get something done and there was pressure involved, suddenly I could achieve it. So creating artificial pressure for myself is something that I find actually works extremely well. And, I, you know, you basically you're lying to yourself, but by creating that artificial pressure, you can actually achieve some amazing things. And all the positives of ADHD can kick in and you do some cool stuff. But how do you do that? How do you make this artificial pressure in a way that even though you know it's fake, that you make it real? Yeah. Well, you, you sort of I say you, know, you make it fake, but you also make bits of it real. So anybody with ADHD will know the whole thing of, you know, leaving stuff to the last minute. Okay, yeah, that's one thing. So I actually set artificial barriers for myself or artificial targets to get things done. So the Pomodoro technique is a great thing to use. So the whole idea of you set a timer and you say, for the next two hours, I will only work on this. Yeah. Um, but also one thing I found, and maybe this is just a personal thing. I'm quite a big character. Unlike some people with ADHD who are quite quiet. No, I'm, I'm, I'm big and I'm mouthy. OK, there's no two ways about it. Well, I can be very meek, but right now I'm in big mouthy mode. So if I'm going to do something, I'll make sure people know that I'm going to do it. Mm. And what happens then is, oh, my goodness, if I don't get this done, mm -hmm. they're going to laugh at me or they're going to say, yeah, you're just as crap as we said you are, Richard. Because obviously everybody who's listening that's got ADHD is being through those phases where people go, you're not that smart. You're just lazy. And so those kind of pains from the past, I actually use to my advantage now in that I make sure I will deliver because I make sure people know. And I use, it's like the old, you know, the whole thing with judo where you use a person's weight and strength against them. Same sort of thing. I use their venom against them and I use it for my positive. Hmm. Do you mean you actually tell people who are almost like enemies or people who are going to judge you? Because I've yeah, often heard absolute, about absolutely. accountability partners and people who've got your back and they care about you and they're going to cheer you on. But it sounds like you go oh, out and all tell of people. The above. All okay. of the above. So I'll give you one example. So um, before I got injured, I used to run ultra marathons. So an ultra marathon, for those of you that don't know, is it, a marathon is 42.2 kilometers, okay, or 26.2 miles, I think it is. Um, an ultra marathon is anything that goes beyond that. But my personal favorites are ones where I would run nonstop for 24 hours. Okay. Idiot. Barking mad idiot. But I would tell people, I'm going to do this. Yes, I'm going to do this. And then it's like, hold on, I better train. I better get my act together. Because if I mm -hmm. don't do well at this, then people are going to laugh at me. And it will be very painful as well. <laughs> well, it was painful regardless. Uh, uh -huh. You know, it's, uh, I did one race, for instance, where in the space of 12 hours, I lost seven kilos in weight. 
Mm. Uh, so, you know, uh, that was in Singapore. But you know, mm-hmm. by making sure you are setting a goal, even if it's a bit of a stretch, by saying, hey, this is something I'm going to achieve. And you've got to believe in yourself. This is the very, very important thing to everybody that's listening. Okay, You have to believe that you can do this. You, you know that you're capable. Everybody that's listening to this, despite every time somebody said you're lazy, you're, you know, you're, you're dumb or anything that's out there, put those people to one side of your brain and say, hey, I'm going to put you in a box and I might use you just like I did. Okay? I might use you later on. But the reality is I know I've done good things. I know I'm not stupid. I know I'm not lazy. And you might not understand why you sometimes are lazy, but now you know because you've got ADHD and where you are on your journey is going to vary, obviously. But you've got to believe in yourself. And as uh, individuals with ADHD, we have certain talents, certain abilities, which actually elevate us above the neurotypical people. And if you can take advantage of those, and maybe farm out some of the other stuff to people who are neurotypical, then good things happen. Hmm, absolutely. So t- tell us a bit about the work projects that you're doing. We know you're in media from the Sky TV mm-hmm. example, and I know you, you've got your own podcast as well. What do you get up to? So a lot of what I'm doing these days is I, I pivoted earlier this year. So I was working for a company and I was having a lot of fun um, helping to sell a new technology, which improved the latency when you're having a conversation over things like zoom okay so it's not so bad we're having the conversation now jeremy we're in the same country but during covid i would speak to my dad back in the uk and you know this guy's in his 80s so the technology wasn't so familiar with him and we would talk over the top of each other because of the latency that that was there it actually got to the point where it was like the old uh, war movies where you got the big radio and you had to say over at the end of each sentence uh-huh. uh, so the technology I was working on at the time, it uh, actually reduced that latency down so people could actually play musical instruments together remotely, oh, which wow. is, yeah, we think about the latency, you know, the actual gap between somebody doing something and it appearing at the other end. Hmm. Very, very cool. But sadly, that came to an end quite abruptly because of the tech crunch. You know, people had made a few mistakes on their uh, financial sums and I was out. So hmm. I took the time to pivot. I took the time to retrain myself and ended up doing my first podcast. And having worked in media in and around TV and films for most of my life, I had some understanding. My early podcasts are awful, though. I can honestly say, I look at the first ones, I'm like, I'm bad. I'm really bad. But then I just kept going, got better, learned things, taught myself how to do things, and took the time. And that's where the ADHD kicked in as well. And that was the actual uh, the moment when I really started to enjoy what I was doing. And each time I'm doing something, I try and add something new to it. So, for instance, started off doing these podcasts about entrepreneurs. Great. That was working for somebody else. Then, because those started to go well, I got asked to focus solely on doing podcasts about AI. Now, I was already doing AI work in the background. But to mend, to, to merge these two, to blend them, was actually really cool. Hmm. And so that's all expanded. So now I have a, a minimum of a weekly podcast. There's only two podcasts go out each week. One will be an interview with somebody talking about AI and one will be something else. That could be an instructional video. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen, Jeremy, I've got a digital version of me that's running around the internet called Pix. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen any of those videos. And um, th- th- there may be some connection. There's this character called Max Headroom that people talk to me about. I have no idea who he is, but hey, you know, it is what it is. And Then there's the live events that we're doing, and those are going really well. So we actually get in an expert to talk about the sort of things they're doing with AI. Mm -hmm. And we give uh, some tech news, this sort of stuff. And it's constantly helping people. And that's the thing that I love doing most. So it's all around podcasts. It's all around video. I also do side consultancy with AI, uh, where I show people how to use things. And they say, hey, I've got this particular problem. How can I fix this using AI? Mm. And so it's all about using the podcast to find people like yourself, but then on top of that, actually helping people in the real world, both at a company level and an individual level in in just lots of different ways. And as much as possible using AI, because it just makes life easier. Mm, Absolutely. That's great that you're able to to use all of the the creativity and Mm. your past experience in media as well. 
are there ways that you're using AI with your own, the podcast process? And can you tell us more about that little avatar that you have as well? The yeah. digital version of yourself? Yeah. So um, on the AI side, there's some really great, uh, you know, bits of technology that have come through. Even just creating a short script using ChatGPT or Bard from Google is very good. Okay, so you can do some things there, but yeah, but the thing about using AI is you must always put the groundwork in first. So, for instance, when it comes to using ChatGPT, have a play, great, but don't use it in any serious way unless you've gone into the section called Common Instructions and set that up, because that will transform things. Now, the reason I say that is because the digital version of me, the character who's called Pix, Pix is short for Pixel Rich or Pixel Richard, and he looks like me, he sounds like me but he's actually a fully AI generated version of me. I will type in what he really says. And sometimes it'd be my voice. Sometimes it'd be his voice. You can't tell most of the time, but the reality is I am a 51 year old fat middle-aged man. And sometimes I don't feel like shaving and making myself look good in the morning. Right. There's only so much I can do. So to actually have a digital version who can run around and do things and say things and uh, actually get on with things. It's very cool. So if you go to AI advantage show, you'll find one of the podcasts, is called ChatGPT for work-life balance. And that's where Pix actually comes to life and will talk to you and show you how to use ChatGPT for things that you might not expect. So the example of this would be that the, the podcast in general is about becoming an entrepreneur. Everything I do with AI is not about the, oh, no, it's going to take our jobs. Oh, no, the Terminators are coming, all this sort of stuff. No, we, we, we push away from that. In fact, I've got a book coming out in the not-too-distant future called Don't Mention the Matrix because I'm incredibly frustrated with, you know, the first things that people mention about AI are the Matrix, Terminator, or it's going to take our jobs. Okay, fine. There's going to be some negatives, but let's focus on the positives that we can extract from this because it's not going away. But on ChatGPT, uh, with the work-life balance, if you're transitioning from working in a job to maybe being an entrepreneur yourself, then that structure to your day is gone. You know, other people turning up, availability of people, you know, rocking up to work, that commute into work that you know you've got to be there for a certain time all evaporate. So by Going into ChatGPT and saying in common instructions, these are the hours I can work. These are the sort of things I want to achieve. And then asking it to write you a schedule for your working week. That then comes out and puts that sort of thing in there. And if you watch the video and say, look, it's AIadvantage.show and look and find the uh, section called ChatGPT for work-life balance, it doesn't go into the techie stuff. It even gets into you know the sort of foods you can eat, what sort of exercise you can do just to be better at being an entrepreneur. And this mm. is and this is one of the things that I love about AI and the way it can help people with ADHD. So something that I mentioned earlier on, and you'll hear, and anybody that's got ADHD will hear this when they watch any of the videos that are out there, find people who are neurotypical to do certain types of jobs. Okay, great. There's nobody more neurotypical than uh, ChatGPT. <laughs> Okay. Mm. So you ask ChatGPT to do the stuff that you don't like to do. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And that's what I do. And it's great. Mm. Yeah. And, and sometimes even if it doesn't do it perfectly, I find for me, it's almost like body doubling that it screws it up. And I'm like, oh, come on, it, this is clearly wrong. I'm just going to edit this part. And something that I didn't want to touch, suddenly it feels more approachable because well, I've almost got someone helping me with it. I actually had a, an experience just yesterday with somebody and uh, a lady in her seventies, would you believe? And she's in, in a bit of a dispute with a neighbor and she asked for a bit of help with something. And I've helped her out on a computer and things like this over the years. And she showed me this letter that she'd written and it's like, okay, can I just show you something? And there was a lot of emotion in this letter okay, that she'd written and she was going to deliver it to the neighbor. And I said, let me just show you something. I took the letter, put it into chat GPT and said, summarize this into a simple letter as if it was written by somebody with legal knowledge. And it wrote the most perfect, beautiful summary of a letter that this woman had ever seen. She sat there, mouth on the floor. And now she's gone home and I, I sat her up on chat GPT and she said, oh, can I do this, can I do this? And now, in, like I say, in her mid seventies, she's grabbed chat GPT 
and she is having a conversation with it. And that's the interesting thing about the body doubling, whether you're neurodivergent or not, to actually have a conversation. And I think that's actually one of the clever things that OpenAI have done in that when they say the prompts, uh, or what, the prompts aren't referred to as prompts, it's a chat. If you look at that, you know, new chat, and if you treat it like a conversation, then you can do some very, very cool things. It isn't a replacement for real people. Okay, let's not let's not go down that route. But, but to be able to spitball things with people, to be able to ask advice, to be able to role play how things might work, then doing that body doubling, and, and as you say, Jeremy, having that argument <laughs> with you know, it's like, oh man, you got that so wrong. And Chat GPT will listen. That is the interesting thing. Mm. Bard will do the same and you know llama 2 and all the other ones they're getting there as well so i think that anything like this treat chat gpt as as a person and you can set it to have personalities multiple personalities actually in fact there's another video on my site uh called virtual teams with pix the, the character that i've created and he shows you how to put multiple people in there so i've got you know a marketing uh woman who works for me who's from california Okay. And she doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've got a, a sales guy called Bob who thinks that he is Harrison Ford. You know, and you, you know, I, I've got a, a, C, a CFO who wants to be, uh, you know, out of the Bond movies and, you know, uh, Dame Judy Dench out of the Bond movies. Mm-hmm. And you, you put these things in here. And one of the things I find as well is if there is somebody that you are a fan of, so let's take your example, let's take an example of, uh, you wanted to ask financial questions. Hmm. Okay. You could say, give me a response in the style of Warren Buffett. Okay. And guess what? It does it. If you like anything, you could say, give me the style, uh, give me a response in the style of Jeremy Clarkson. And it will do something similar to that. And I think it's very, very powerful. I mean, don't hmm. forget, I mean, massive caveat here for anybody that's listening Chat GPT does hallucinate. And it is not a replacement for true legal advice, medical advice, or any sort of advice. But as Jeremy said, it gets you 80% of the way there. If it saves you time that you might have to spend money on with experts and professionals in specific fields, then that has to be a good thing. And it can help you do research in a way that uh, you haven't really been able to do before. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Don't, Don't trust it blindly, but it can really help. And speaking of it saving you time, what do you do in your off time when you're not working? Are you, you said you're not doing ultra marathons anymore. No, I, I still like to go running, but um, yeah, I, I can't quite do the distances I used to. So that, and you know, I still have my obsession with all things to do with movies and TV. Uh, so you know, whenever there's a, a good new movie or even a bad new movie, you know, I'll probably go and watch it. So apart from that, and my dogs, I've got a couple of uh, West Highland Terriers, and I also look after dogs for people as well with my wife. So that's quite fun. So that's a lot of my spare time. Nice. Do the dogs come on runs with you? Oh, no, they've got short little legs. Uh, Mm -hmm. And also, you know, what? uh, this is, again, a kind of a neurodivergent thing. Before I realized what was going on, part of the challenge I had was I was so focused on work that, especially today with the way that you have your phone with you and uh, you've got constant emails throughout the day, and I've invariably worked for international organizations. So wherever I am in the world, doesn't matter i'll be working for people in multiple countries all at the same time Hmm. so i can get emails throughout the day one of the few times i could switch off and move away from work was when i was out running for long distances and again it was a combination of using the positives of adhd or using the the elements of adhd in a positive way so i got very much into the science of ultramarathons and i wanted to do well so i would look at things like what foods i should eat what stride length i should have what my heart rate should be and so when I would go out training, I could go out running for two, three hours or walking or whatever it might be, I would be focused on things like, am I getting the right cadence with my feet? Am I putting my stride length in my heart rate in the zone it needs to be to be burning fuel at this right, uh, at the correct rate? Okay. Wasn't thinking about work. Hmm. That, that was as close to meditation as I could possibly get. So, hmm. pe- you know, some people with ADHD out there may be, have been told, oh, you need to meditate. It will help you. And maybe it will. It doesn't help me. I need to be doing stuff that completely takes me away from uh, work. And trust me, when you're running and you start to feel that pain and you're focusing, you're in a different world and you don't think about work at all. 
Yep, I know what you mean. I I've done some shorter ultras, fifty <laughs> k's, but a lot of respect for oh, doing those twenty four okay, hours. Good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just that's you do that in five hours, and then you've you've got another nineteen Wait, hours it, to do. It takes you that long? Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, this is you. <laughs> Classic winners jokes. It's always funny. I would meet people who would focus on marathons or half marathons, and of course they were like, "Oh wow, ultra marathons. That's for people who can't go fast." It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Uh, yeah, but it takes a special kind of both physical strength, but also mental determination. And your you comment about meditation is really interesting because a lot of people will say when you wake up, the first thing you should do is meditate. And I can't really do that. I, I can meditate after mm -hmm. I run. And it sounds like you're similar. What do you do in your morning routine? Do you have, do you ever do mindfulness practices or what sort of things do you aim to do? Well, I've normally got a bunch of stuff that I have to do in the morning. Right. Okay. And actually because of the podcast, I interview a lot of people in America. Hmm. Okay. So being in Australia, meeting interview in America, it can be quite early in the morning. So it's not unusual for me to do uh, a podcast interview at 7am. Hmm. So there are certain things I need to do. I need to get up and, uh, and have something to eat, make sure that um, you have to get the blood sugar levels at the right level then I can take my meds and I need to do that within a certain amount of time. There's a certain routine to make myself look half decent for the screen, all these sorts of things. So my morning routine is based around, there is a target that I have to hit and I actually work backwards from that target. So I know it will take me X amount of time to do each job. And it might be to, you know, shave and to sort my hair out and to, you know, get the puffiness out of my eyes and all this sort of stuff it's going to take me 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. I need to make sure that I've got a mini script written for the person I'm going to interview. I at least need to know something about that person before I start talking to them. Yeah. So I actually work backwards from the events. So each day will be different. I know for some people having a set bunch of things that they do in the morning is important. That doesn't work for me. What I do, you know, sometimes I'll just try and lay in bed. Great. But invariably um, that's never going to work. You know, the brain will kick in and things will have to happen. But thankfully, because I am so busy and there's always something to do, if I can do some degree of planning ahead, if I can say that at nine o'clock, I must be doing this job and then work backwards from there, that's my morning routine. And the morning routine will change every day. Or so it can be different every day. You know, if I've got a podcast at 8 a.m., five days a week, then the routine will probably be, probably be very similar for those days. And so, you know, the night before, I've got it in my, uh, on my Outlook schedule, that at 4.30, I do some prep for the following day's podcast. And I might, it's like, you know, some days where I could have five podcasts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And 25 minutes, but each one to do everything is an hour because you have warm up sessions, we have a chat and so on and so forth. But to do that prep the night before takes the bad stress away. Hmm. Because then you can get up and you say, I can focus on the stuff that I can't do the night before. And this is probably the most important thing related to your question. Make your morning routine the stuff that can only be done in the morning, if you can. Yeah. Whatever you can prep the night before or the day before, do it. Because, yeah, and while you've got energy, while, you know, while your meds are working or while you've got, you know, a bit of time, like I say, I sit down i make sure i've got everything set up in advance for my interviews and then the more the stuff that i can't do the night before like shave as a simple example that's the stuff i focus on yeah that makes sense and i'm going to ask you a bit later about your evening routine but ah. that, that overall philosophy makes a lot of sense what do you do on days where maybe you don't ever have days like this but say you didn't have anything until 11 a.m what would you do in that situation well, it's very rare that that is the case. I, I won't yeah. pretend. Look, there's always things to do. The main one for me, and this is you know a tip that I would give to anybody. Uh, you know, if you've got kids, this is one thing, but we have dogs, and the dogs are demanding. And you can't explain to a dog that you can't take them for a walk too easily. And mm -hmm. you know, these are you know relevant little beings that have life and value. And so you know what, take them for a walk. Mm. or you know i have been working over the last couple of years to regain my physical health so you know if i know that i've got a bit of time it's like hey you know i'll go for a walk in the hills i'll uh you know get on my spin bike and do a bit of work there so 
I always try and find something to do because, uh, and again, maybe this is something that other people with ADHD have. There's the old line about the devil makes work for idle hands. Okay. I'm a big believer in that old saying. And I think people with ADHD probably get affected by this more than anybody. And so you will find things to do. And they're not always the best things. You will search for that neuro, uh, you know, divergent little thing. You will search for that dopamine. So it might be that you'll find that bar of chocolate. It might be that you will slam that extra five cups of coffee. It might be that you do something that you shouldn't. So by having good choices you can go to when you have that bit of spare time, things that have a positive benefit, and you can say, hey, that will contribute to something positive overall, even if it's only a small like couple of percentage points of it, then that's how I try and fill those gaps. Hmm. Love it. That makes a lot of sense. We spoke a bit earlier about optimizing productivity through mm-hmm. AI. Are there other mm-hmm. non-AI techniques that you have for maximizing your productivity? Yeah, I mean, the, the Pomodoro technique is one I'm a big fan of, setting a time where you will only focus on one thing. Because again, in classic ADHD style, if you're not careful, you see something, it's like, Ooh, you know, you're going to go after that. You know, the old yep. scroll thing. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's the point. It doesn't hurt to sit down at the start of the day. If I've got a lot of work to do, what I will do is I will, every morning, if I can, if I remember, set myself a to-do list for that day. Okay. And you may not necessarily get everything done on your to-do list. Some jobs you can't get done in one day. But I actually have my screen set up and I've got quite an unusual setup here, but I've got like, you know, multiple screens here, but you can do this with a piece of paper. You can do it. I used to do it with a, uh, you know, it's just a marker board. And I'll tell you a really cool trick about that in a second, but I will have sat in front of me somewhere in my field of vision or to a place that I go on a regular basis, the stuff that has to get done that day or stuff that you want to do today. Now, the trick that I worked out with my wife was that we put a marker board next to the coffee machine in the kitchen. Okay, So I'm constantly backwards and forwards making myself a a coffee. And we would both write the things that need to get done that day. So if my wife needed me to get a job done, she would write, you know, do whatever it would be on the, uh, marker board next to the coffee machine and it's that constant seeing these things on a regular basis so it doesn't escape your your uh your mind but also it takes advantage of that kind of squirrel approach to, oh yes no i've got to do that this is that as well and so again i'm trying to use the some of the negatives that people see in adhd to my advantage so the oh oh yeah i've got to do that because i forgot about that i was supposed to do that this morning no okay better get that done now but it's the thing that's got to be done that day so hmm. like I say, set time boxing any other things using the Pomodoro technique, trying to set blocks of the day to do specific jobs. But this, the biggest tip I can give people is have a visual list somewhere in, uh, you know, your working day, you know, your, wherever it might be, that is always there and it will remind you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, you take it down when you're working on, something for a set amount of time but if you like say next to the coffee machine if you're mm. drinking all day long put up that board and write you know get your partner or if there's something you need to do put it up there and it's amazing how much gets done mm. and if you don't drink coffee put it next to the toilet maybe yeah exactly <laughs> i mean what, adapt these techniques however you want but you know whatever it might be you know, put it next to the kettle put it next to i don't know the you, yeah, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. But something where you are going to go to on a regular place, a re- regular uh, kind of basis. And so you are constantly reminded of it. And it's not nagging. Okay. Mm. Anybody with ADHD will know that somebody going, well, why haven't you done this yet? It's a mm-hmm. wonderful, it's a wonderful phrase to hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you don't need to tell me, I, I've, you know, I'll get it done in the next year or two. <laughs> uh, but, but the, you know, it, it's, that constant reinforcement. And if it's done in a non-judgmental way, and that's what the board will do. Yeah. So it's not a case of get this done, you idiot. No, it's just a statement of, for the sake mm-hmm. of argument, put up shelves. Could mm-hmm. be as simple as that. So, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, got to get that done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One other little addition to that that doesn't hurt um, is obviously my wife and myself, we have different handwriting styles. Probably like most people are, uh, who are listening today, mine looks like it's been done by a spider 
uh, you know, who's taken lots of drugs, right? Anyway, whereas my wife has this beautiful writing style that looks great. So I can actually see, you know, the stuff that she wants me to do and to be positive with the relationship, actually seeing that writing in her handwriting style adds extra priority, adds extra emphasis to it. So it's going to be something that would have a positive knock-on effect to my overall relationship with my wife to mm. get that particular job done. Mm. And if it's a case of, you know, people are using text or whatever, make sure that the people put their initials next to it. Mm. Yeah. But so that you've got some emphasis, some positive connection. And it's like, say, for me, I keep trying to think, okay, what are the future positives? ADHP, ADHD people or neurodivergent people do very much live in the moment. Having that hook to the future, the longer term goal, like I say, the way I explained about uh, potentially embarrassing myself by talking about what I was going to do on multi marathons, there's always that nagging thing, that voice, and you're using the negatives uh, for in a positive way on this occasion. This is, you've got that out there. Oh, I don't want to let my wife down because We've all been there. We've said we would do something and we haven't. And we're like, mm. oh, and I can't believe I forgot that. Mm. And you feel bad. Uh, and it's probably uh, also positive reinforcement that when you start doing those things, you might get extra praise because it, it's so unusual to have done the shelves or whatever those. Exactly. Are. And and who doesn't love it? praise when it comes to ADHD? Yeah. Yeah. I, I changed the sheets yesterday and my wife praised me for it. So well, there you go. You see, it's like. <laughs> Other, Positive yeah, reinforcement. But, yeah, I think the thing to remember there, though, is you know there is a law of diminishing returns. If every time you yeah. change the sheets, you go, "Hey, I changed <laughs> the sheets," and she's like, "Yes, we know, Jeremy. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay, mate." But you change it six times that day. It doesn't work like that, mate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once every two weeks is enough for me at this stage. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, now, and just a, a quick plug again with the Pomodoro technique. One of the aspects of that is that you take breaks after you do the work. So we're going to take a quick break now. Hi there, Focus and Chillers. Are you ready to supercharge your knowledge in the realms of creativity, tech, and psychology? Come check out my fortnightly newsletter. In each edition, you'll get quick wins and actual takeaways that you can put into practice right away. If this sounds like you, I'd love to have you as a reader. Subscribe for your fortnightly dose of insights. The link is in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. We're back from our break, and I'm now going to ask you about a bad habit that you either are about to remove or that you have removed from your life in the past, Richard. Oh, that is a really great question. I think before I realized about ADHD, it was not unusual for me to drink quite heavily. Okay, And I've been in uh, work positions where you essentially drink professionally. Mm -hmm. You work in sales. The socializing part of that is not insignificant. And... I'd also injured myself uh, from doing ultra marathons. Uh, so a bit of a throwback there, but I was going through a huge amount of pain with my knees uh, for a while. So to combine ADHD with uh, pain and alcohol, that was a very bad habit. So whilst I still enjoy drinking, you know, uh, the, the one or two bottles of red that I could quite happily consume on Friday night has gone. I, that just doesn't happen anymore. So I think, that's one of the things that when I, I learned about ADHD and the way that you s search for dopamine, alcohol, or whatever other substance you may imbibe, when you get properly medicated and you start to get your life together as, as a result of that, you'd be amazed how many of these vices and how many of these behaviors go as a result of that. Mm. Thanks a lot for sharing it. And that's great to hear about the change there. Mm. I had issues with substance abuse in the past as well. And I think it is almost self-medicating. Oh, it, it undoubtedly is. But one of the things was when I managed to do that, I also, would you believe, lost 25 kilos, so like 55 pounds. Mm. So, you know, but that was all part of the journey and just to get myself into a better place. Mm. Amazing. So if you're not drinking in the evening, how do you switch off at night? I see. I'm not sure I ever do. <laughs> um, uh, and that's always been me. So uh, there's certain elements that, that some people say are negatives about ADHD, which I kind of enjoy. Uh, one of the things I do, and this is probably a bad one is you know, I'll get stuck in a YouTube loop. You know, I'll sit there and I'll be watching something and I, it's amazing how, how quickly nine o'clock in the evening turns to one o'clock in the morning, if you're not careful, but I'm not thinking about work. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things, but also you're know, socializing for God's sake, if you can get out and be with people and it's not always comfortable, 
uh, and it's not always easy, but wherever possible, you know, get out. And the more you socialize, the better you get at it. And, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say stupid things occasionally. And, you know, anybody with ADHD has done this. But look, just you've got to keep trying, because if you don't, you're never going to get better at things. <laughs> For me, sometimes socializing can be fun, but it's also draining. Is that... Mm -hmm. Well, I've got autism as well, so it probably mm. doesn't help. But is that something that you find is almost as part of switching off at night? Is it because it, it disconnects you from work and it allows you to relax a bit more hanging out with other people? Is that yeah, not, there? Uh, absolutely. But also, and this is probably the, the, the F word, let's let's be really serious about it, fun. Mm. Okay? You've mm. got to have fun in life. Mm. And that's going to make me sound like, oh, you got to have fun in life, like, no, man, man. But no, the reality is, Go ahead and try and have some fun. And it might be that you can combine your, you know, your traits in some way. So it might be that, you know, you're into graphics cards. It might be into Dungeons and Dragons. It might be into 1920s movies or it doesn't matter what it is. Find your tribe. Mm. Okay. Find people who will, th there's a certain amount of what you would be interested in that there will be that lovely Venn diagram. Mm. Okay. And they may be neurodivergent. They may not. But if you can join on that bit in the middle, then all of a sudden you've got so much further there. And look, let's face it, whatever you're into, if you've got ADHD, you can probably talk about it for hours. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to break down some of those social barriers uh, at some point. Mm, absolutely. Is there anything else that you do to wind down in the evening to help uh, you I'm, get to sleep, for example? Uh, well, sleep's always been the biggest challenge. Mm. And I've tried lots of different techniques over the years. Uh, certainly I find that white noise or pink noise depending uh, with a set of earbuds is a good thing i used to listen to podcasts to try and sleep but you, know, you wake up to somebody talking uh, with audiobooks which is always quite weird so what i tend mm. to do is these days i will have like say something in and it will be white noise pink noise take your pick to stop external um you know distractions so you, know, you might hear something off in the distance and you wake up you know, because even when you're just a little bit asleep, your brain's still working. And with ADHD, you know, that whole thing of grab, you know, the scribble thing. If you can block as much of that out as possible, that's good. I mean, it does have a negative connotation in that, you know, sometimes you know, my, my wife will get frustrated because I'll have my headphones in and I'm doing things. So, for instance, you know, emptying the dishwasher, for instance. I'll be there and I'll put my phone there and I'll have some headphones in. I'm actually watching something while I'm doing this. It's great. And I get the job done. I'm not distracted by anything else at that point. Oh, I've got the right level of distraction, but she's talking to me and I'm like, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so there is a balancing act and it's not always easy. Mm. Yeah. That, that's really good tip because it, it's really annoying if there's, for example, I live not too far away from a, a train line and if mm -hmm. the train comes along at 5am and toots its horn, it's not a, yeah. a great way to wake up. I mean, what I would say to people is be, you've got to get the right sort of headphones and there's actually some of these sleep bands you can get because mm. if you sleep in a certain way and you force the earbud into your ear, mm. it can be very painful. Yep. So just be, just be aware of that or you end up sleeping in a very, you, you develop a technique of sleeping in a very specific way. But there's these headbands you can get, which actually work really well. You can be odd, odd night, you look a little strange, mm -hmm. but trust me, a good night's sleep is worth it. Mm, absolutely. What other resources would you recommend in terms of books or you mentioned the the headband, mm -hmm. any philosophies or apps or sensory toys that you use? Well, I, I certainly have used various ADHD toys over the years. Okay. And you know, you, you've got, there's so many out there. Okay. Find the one that works for you. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be literally just playing with a pen. Uh, but if you're going to do it, do it in a way to not be, uh, obtrusive or you know do it so people aren't kind of going why the hell are you doing that why are you doing that with your pen because that will just annoy them um when it comes to any other tips there get some coaching okay you are listening to this podcast no doubt because you want to learn something about other people who've been through other parts of the adhd journey find a good adhd coach okay uh, i would also say and this is something i helped with for quite a while myself is if there is a local group a support group for people with ADHD, go along to that group. Because that's one of the things where I learned more about ADHD and coping mechanisms by meeting other people and hearing their stories. 
And it's when you start to learn, oh my goodness, the things I did that I thought I was the only person in the world, there are so many other people out there that have done this and uh, they say it worse. You know, it's like, oh, I thought I was bad. That person, oh, geez. <laughs> you know? And so yeah, you start to say, oh, I'm not as bad as I thought I was. You know? so, uh, but also you, you, the, the beautiful thing about this, and this is something that I'm very uh, passionate about, is as you get further along in your own journey about discovering you have ADHD and your own techniques, you get the opportunity to help other people. Hmm. And that for me is probably the most important thing. You, know, you, you meet somebody, you see they were where you were years ago, and you have the opportunity to help them. And that's got to be a good thing. Mm, absolutely. Love it. If people want to find your podcast, where's the best place to look? I guess we can well, see it in your background. You can see it in my background. So it's aiadvantage.show. Uh, the interview um, podcast comes out once a week, as I say, but we also have the live events, which are once a month. The next uh, one is the beginning of November. Uh, and there will be several others there. We also have the ability for you to book time with me uh, using the QR code on screen, or if you go to the website, I can actually do an AI consultant, uh, consultancy session with you as well. Amazing. Do you have any final words or asks for the audience? Well, I think that the final words I'd say for today is if you're listening to this and you, you found this podcast because you suspect you have ADHD or some other type of neurodivergence, you know, we've talked about ADHD, but there's lots of other things there. Um, or you've been recently diagnosed regardless of age. It's going to be some challenges, okay? Let's not, you know, pretend. And there's going to be a mourning phase that you will go through when you think about the, what could have been. If you've seen the movie uh, Sliding Doors, the Gwyneth Paltrow movie, you know, that, that moment where she could have gone one direction or she could, could, could have gone another, and it's affected her life. It's like, what if I'd have been diagnosed early? What if I could have, uh, you know, I've been medicated when I was in my teens as opposed to in my 20s, 30s, 40s in my case? Well, guess what? You can't. Okay, that's never going to change. And this sounds a bit harsh, but here's the thing. You've got two halves to your life. And they're not even halves. The first half is when you didn't know. And that could be rough at times. The second half is you know you're developing techniques. So make that the best half of your life. That's what I would say to you. I love that. Really inspiring. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, Richard. Really great to uh, come on, Jeremy. And as I say, your episode with us was fantastic. So thank you as well. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Focus and Chill podcast. To listen to other episodes, jump onto podcast.focusbear.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a good fit, email us at team at focusbear.io. Otherwise, stay focused, stay chilled and peace out.